welcome. So this online training on macroeconomic modeling for sustainable development planning, which is a, a lecture organized for the Young Economist Network across Africa. This lecture is the first part of the macroeconomic model known as dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. As a means of uh, outline, there is two major outline that I would like you to know. Is one will be on the theoretical part or theoretical background of the lecture. And then the second one we deal with uh, part two that will be talking about the practical aspect of the work. Now let's start with the introduction. Macroeconomic models are tools to aid policy making in response to whatever position the economy finds ourselves, either in boom or bust, expansion or downturn. Thus, the optimal desire of a modeler is to build a model that enables authorities to achieve a goal of full employment, price stability, economic growth, and balance of payments. Now, in addition, the associated goal enshrined in the 17 point agenda of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, and those of the Agenda 2063 specific to the African continent are expected to be considered in each country's development plan. Now, in particular, the challenges facing the African continent are multidimensional, originating from exogenous and endogenous shocks, which are rooted in structural imbalances amidst the desired growth for sustainable long-run growth and development of uh, Africa. Thus, at our Golden Jubilee Summit in 2013, the African Union, AU, embarked on an ambitious but compelling continental development plan tagged Agenda 2063. The agenda has seven aspirations, 20 goals, and 39 priorities. areas. These were designed to ensure Africa's long-term socioeconomic, political, and integrative transformation of the continent in the context of globalized world. Thus, young economists or macroeconomists are increasingly expected to become experts in dynamic macroeconomic model development. This is to enable them contribute to the development of evidence-based models that provide insight into the workings of the economies of Africa. And so, among the various streams of macroeconomics, is the dynamic general equilibrium, generally tagged DGE models, is one of the most appropriate to address some of the issues I mentioned earlier. Okay, so in the class of these DGE models are the various variants of dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models which provide basis for understanding the economy's policy analysis, simulation, scenario analysis, 
estimation as well as well as forecasting. In a troubled world economy, often distorted by uncertainties or shocks, the importance of DIGE models cannot be overemphasized. Thus, YEN members are encouraged to use this training program on DIG model to investigate the trajectory, trajectories to achieving the African we want most efficiently and realistically. This component of the training is designed for beginners in DIG modeling. It is also assumed that participants are drawn from different disciplines. This component of the Yen training on dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model is divided into two parts. So in part one, a strong theoretical background is presented in order to build a solid foundation for DSG modeling. The presentation is, sol is structured into the following sections. One, the evolution of modern macroeconomics. Two, the uh, business cycle method. Three, three business cycle models. Four, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. And five, the future of macroeconomics. And the, this part would be helpful in understanding the practical aspect of the training. In part two, or part two is mainly on the practical issues in solving and reporting DSG models using dynamic software. This, it is divided into the following subsections. A, basic concepts, B, estimation of this model using dynamic software. So what is the aim of this uh, modeling training? One is to familiarize participants with the tools needed in the calculation of the main business cycle statistics. Two, train participants on the theoretical basis of DIG modeling. Three, train them in the art of building modern macroeconomic models to explain business cycle fluctuations. It is also to train participants in the use of software, dynamic software to solve DIG model, learn the usefulness of dynamic in the calibration, simulation, estimation, and forecasting of DIG models and develop their capacity to interpret economic phenomena in order to come up with appropriate policy recommendation. And that would be the first lesson in this DIG model. Now, according to the uh, table of content we have shown you, the first module here will be talking about the evolution of macroeconomics. Okay? Evolution of macroeconomics. So, like I said earlier on, we need to understand where we are coming from so that we will now understand how we get to where we are and then to be able to now look into the further future, uh, future as far as macroeconomic modeling is concerned. So, historically, macroeconomics is undoubtedly an evolving science over time. In this context, it was after the Second World War of 1939 to 1945 that macroeconomics took its rightful place in the honor of macroeconomic analysis, following Keynes' book on general theory. That was in 1936. 
the two mainstream, which are classical and Keynesian, emerge in the analysis of economic phenomena. And since then, various schools of thought have surfaced in response to the economic challenges, uh, economic challenges of the uh, of the moment. I was talking about the mainstreams, the two mainstreams, which are classical and Keynesian, that emerged after the Second World War. And uh, that has brought in so many schools of thoughts. And you will see further which school of thought uh, this uh, analysis belongs to. Now, now, still talking about the two mainstreams, in this regard, Teaching of macroeconomics was essentially based on the traditional model Fleming model or ISLMBP or ADAS model. That was at the beginning. Now, under this approach, macroeconomic variables were seen as aggregate, and there was no recourse to the underlying micro foundation. So the approach was based on piecemeal partial equilibrium approach. But what brought in the DG macro models now? Now, according to Wickens 2008, the origin of DG macro, macroeconomics lies in the work of Lucas, 1975, Thailand and Prescott, 1982, and Long and Plosa, 1983 with their works on real business cycles, okay? So what is the, uh, the objective of DG? The objective is to explain the dynamic behavior of the economy based on the assumption of competitive rational expectations, equilibrium models, inspired by economic growth model. Mm -hmm. So, since then, dynamic general equilibrium model have become basis for macroeconomic analysis. Now, what are the basic assumptions? Like I said, there will be some assumptions to support what you are doing. Now, in the case of Canadian school of thought, some functions were introduced. In other words, this uh, DIG is the Keynesian school of thought, all right? And usually we call them the new Keynesians, okay? And the assumptions were for the existence of monopolistic competition, sticky prices, real and nominal shocks, as well as non-neutrality of money, gave rise to the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, the new Keynesian approach. Okay, so like I said, that new Keynesian formed the theoretical basis of DSG model. Okay, so what is DSG? DSG is dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. This is the standard tool or workhorse in modern macroeconomic analysis. It is a fully integrated framework for policy analysis. Must note that it is a unified framework to study both business cycles and economic growth. Okay, so the acronym is formed from uh, four letters, dynamic meaning the explicit inclusion of time factor, Stochastics meaning the introduction of uncertainties or shocks. This is very important for whatever is the DIG modeling. And then the G is about the general equilibrium. That means as far as we have seen, everything is in everything. If you talk, touch one aspect of the economy, it has a way of reverberating into the other parts of the economy, okay? Consequently, the following questions are pertinent. How prepared are you as a member of YEN to evaluate economic situations and make informed judgments? Two, how do we reconcile seemingly conflicting economic positions 
with the current economic realities. And three, how can economics be used to understand the world better and improve on it? For how does the economy respond to different shocks? And five, how do we quantify specifically the effect of money and fiscal policies? And finally, how do we quantify the welfare effects of policy? Now, before we go further, let's discuss about the basic structure of a macroeconomics model. In general, there are two main structures. They are simple Keynesian model or the one called traditional. And the second one is the dynamics general equilibrium framework. Now let's look at each of these one after the other. Now, the first one is what is called the ad hoc models. That is in the former approach, the usual piecemeal traditional or ad hoc macroeconomic models describing the, the structure of this form of model is as follows. Now, if you look at the equation, it means you just determine what you are studying. What is the phenomenon you want to study? And then you will term that your dependent variable. And for your independent variable, you just look for theoretical backings, and then you just select any the variables that you think can explain that phenomenon. And in this case, it's simple. Uh, for what we have here, we have four independent variables. And that's all. Have, there is no nothing you are, you know, just make sure you guess well. Hmm? So this one we are used to it, and it could be described looking at this uh, circular flow diagram of the economy, in which case you have two uh, sectors, if you like now, or agents, the farms, and the household. You see that the household buy and consume goods and services. They also own and sell factors of production. Whereas the farms produce and sell goods and services, hire and use factors of production. Okay? So you see uh, uh, income and uh, payments everywhere. Now, there are two markets. Markets for goods and services, and market for factors, which the household sells to the farms. Now, if you look at this, there is the inner, inner cycle, which describes the movement of uh, goods and services, as well as the movement of factors of production, eh? labor, land, and so on. The outside cycle describes what we know as the uh, monetary counterpart of uh, what was exchanged between the two main agents in this study. We will see that here we are only considering a closed economy without government, uh, without government. Okay, so and in this case, the external sector is not brought in now. The second known structure is one due to DGE models. The structure of the DGE model, of DGE macroeconomic model, can be defined in terms of the following system of equations. We have XT equals ET, that means the expected value that's the expectation operator, anyway, of a function f, which is determined by three set of variable, variables. You have x t plus one. You see that this is uh, an expectation, is the future value of x t. Huh? And then z t, which is a vector of endogenous variables, exogenous variables, 
And uh, UT is simply vector of random disturbance, all right? Now you will see that here now we are talking about vector. And that's why we are talking about system of equations. So this equation had to be solved. And then we now use all the computational uh, mechanics now to find solution to the system. So it is different from a single equation that we have shown before uh, in the, the first ad hoc type of models. And this one is the one that um, is more current. You will see that this variable has a feature, uh, feature values. You see the parameter, I mean the variable xt plus one is always is already a forward looking variable, which is not common in the uh, formal analysis of macroeconomic model. So that's one thing we have to note. Then you find that here in this case, the corresponding diagram that will be very useful for us is to look at this, uh, this diagram now, or this figure now. So what you have is you now have this over-shaped uh, uh, figures now, in which you have farms, capital producers, final good producers, entrepreneurs, banks, households, and governments. These are the agents the, uh, defined in this uh, type of models. Th that means here we work essentially with agents. And so it's the interaction of this agent that finally determines the position of an economy by time. You find that you don't have that sense of, I mean, that type of circular flow here. Because what happens here is that you have uh, interaction, you know, transmission mechanism between various uh, agents, but they are really driven by these respective uh, shocks to the uh, each of the households in the economy. For instance, you will see the household. What it can affect household is what we call um habit resist uh, persistence that's habit resistance then you see labor hmm? which is the one i mean the also that leads to farms remember what is important here is that there is the labor itself there is the wage and then that that brought us to the issue of wage rigidities and then you have labor supply shocks Remember, I said labor supply shocks. That means that can be uh, unexpected uh, events that will come and distort the labor market. And therefore, we have a uh, repercussion on the farms. Similarly, what happens to the farms will affect the final good producers. Remember, there are uh, farms some of them producing intermediate goods, and there will be a, 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 another set of farms that will combine the various uh, goods to produce the final goods in the system. You also have the banks, where they also de deposit their money, and then uh, at the end expect uh, dividends. And then between the banks and entrepreneurs, you see the banks are the ones that made money available to entrepreneurs. And what we see here is that there can be what we call credit shocks. When the credit shocks are occurs, it will have effect on the entrepreneurs who are the borrowers from the banks. Similarly, whatever happens between the capital producers and the entrepreneurs will be determined essentially by some, something that is called investment adjustment costs. So these are the things that happen. And when you come to government, you see also that government is another agent in the economy. So any shock, like government policy shocks that happen, we have effect 
on interest rate policies or uh, other policy shocks. We have effects on consumer and then uh, the household in general, and then uh, the effect continues to move across the economy. And so you see from there that the modeling technique here now becomes a little bit different from what we do in the ad hoc uh, modeling style, okay? And so the complication is from here that how do we take into consideration all these uncertainties that can come to set up the uh, economic position of the, uh, of the economy part time? All right, so why do we need to do these theoretical uh, explanations? One, they are important to understand the complex relationship between macroeconomic variables, which cannot be observed by just looking directly at the data. This is very important. Now, if you look at what happened in, the, in each country and across the whole world of recent, there is the, uh, the, the all well now known COVID-19. Now was not uh, a problem emanating from the economic fundamentals. So, but when it came, it has a ripple effect on all the society, lockdown, stoppages of production, uh, tourism, everything was affected. And so from our own, it means that COVID-19 was an uncertainty. Nobody was expecting it. Nobody has predicted it. So it came as a shock to the economy. And therefore we saw all the other all things we saw. So that shows the importance of this type of model in uh, understanding macroeconomy of our society. Okay, secondly, theoretical models can be used to make simulation for policy analysis and counterfactual experiments. Yes, because once we understand the theoretical background, and then we can make policy simulations and see what happens if a uh, certain policy is introduced following a particular shop or perhaps in anticipation of a particular shop, or we can do it as an experiment because this modern macroeconomy is seen as a laboratory. That is why you can test other uh, macroeconomic policies. And thirdly, theoretical models make forecasting possible. In other words, if you have a model that is uh, very, very close to the reality in terms of uh, taking the model that we build to data, and the result shows that it's a very good model, mm, then we can use it to forecast. Mm, okay, and then, um, and that would be very important for us. So understand the theoretical background of DHG models are very, very crucial to the construction and development of these models. So I will now go to module two. In module two, we will talk about business cycle phenomena. Like I told you before, we have to know the theoretical background of this model. Yes, we have talked about the new Keynesian. That's the theoretical basis, you know? Because uh, this model is an offshoot of Keynesian uh, school of thought. So the new Keynesian is also uh, emanating from the Keynesian school of thought. So, but another thing that we should note is this. Now was the economy is subjected to a, a series of fluctuations like we had defined before along the long run growth path. So for economists, it's good to understand what causes this fluctuation and what are they and how can we minimize it 
in order to save the economy from the negative uh, occurrences emanating from such a uh, uh, fluctuations. So business cycle phenomenon. So the business cycle or economic cycle refers to the periodic fluctuations of economic activity about its long-term growth trend. That is just what I've said now. The cycle involves shift over time between periods of relatively rapid growth of output, what we know as recovery or and prosperity, and alternating, I mean alternating with periods of relative stagnation or decline, that is contra contraction or recession. This you can see this clearly by looking at this diagram or this figure hmm, showing the curve around like waves around the long grown trend. Okay, so you see where it is uh, the positive slope there is talking about boom. It gets to a peak and then it begins to fall, passing through recession. If the recession continues without being checked, it goes into depression. And then finally, you see when it reaches a minimum called the trough, the, uh, the growth part begins to turn up. So if you look at this from this first point to this, you see that it's like a cycle, but uh, you know, it's cyclical. Okay, so that's the a kind of futuristic of uh, the business cycle. Now, let's now look at few uh, perspectives of some researchers. According to Michel, 1927, Business cycle is characterized by a sequence of expansion and contraction, particularly emphasizing turning points and phases of the cycle. According to the Luca, according to Lucas 1977, business cycle is the statistical properties of the co-movement of deviation from the trend of various economic aggregates with those of the real output. And Kyle and, and Prescott says business cycles are a recurrent nature of events, recurrent nature of re events. Okay, in other words, they are just interpreting that diagram that an economy is subjected to expansion at a particular point, it reaches the maximum. Mm, and that is when there is a kind of what we call overheating. And then at that point, the economy, things will begin to happen, invisible hands will take over, and then the economy starts to fall. So once it reaches a trough, where it will now begin to experience another growth again. Now, according to Kylands and the press code, 1982, uh, that is the, their own definition. Okay, and finally, Lucas 1977 talks about business cycle as the recurrent fluctuation of output, a bad trend, and the co-movement among other aggregate time series. Okay, you can find that more in Alleged 2008. But then there are uh, steps. I think here is uh, five steps in business cycle studies. One, we have to document the stylized facts that characterize business cycles in modern society. Two, construct a theoretical business cycle model that can be used to explain the phenomenon. Three, evaluate evaluation of the ability or the different version of the model to generate business cycle with realistic magnitude. And four, 
quantify how large welfare costs of business cycles are, and then finally analyze with the help of the models how effective monetary, fiscal, and other policies are in taming cyclical fluctuations of the economy. Okay. So we must know that then that is an important uh, section again when you talk about business cycle. Mm? Now we need to establish what we call business cycle facts and the language that will be used henceforth. The, the, uh, most of the facts that were deduced from this business cycle facts. Now, in doing this, we have our data, whether on the lead GDP or on any other components of the lead GDP, that we must distill so that we can separate the um, cycle from the trend, okay? So we say there is a sort of discomposition of the growth trend and business cycle. That means each of the variables, particularly GDP, has, when you see the variable, it has two components, the growth trend as well as the business cycle. So our problem is first to be able to separate these two components and work with the ones that is the business cycle uh, component of the data. All right, so what we saw, or what we are seeing in equation one is simply the growth equation that is very common to everybody. Uh, you know, there's a white here now, that means the current actual value of any variable is simply equals to the value, the initial value, that multiplies the particular growth rate, given the time. So that means you can have the, the, the time factor at a, a, any time, but you can use this formula to calculate. For instance, we can know what is the, uh, like uh, what is the population of Nigeria today, simply knowing what it was about 20 years ago, and then applying the growth rate uh, of population, uh, the population growth rate, as well as the time period between that time and now. And that will give us um, the current level of population, for instance. And then, uh, and it is easier to work with log transformation in this aspect of work. So that's why we have log white. It just if we transform this equation one into log, this is what we get. And finally, you can see that that equation log y is simply log y zero plus log one plus g t. So it means log one plus g to us is simply a constant term. So it's like we have a linear model where t is the dependent variable here and then y t, uh, no, where t is the independent variable and what is the uh, dependent variable. Okay, so you can see the slope, as like I said now, is simply log one plus g, and the intercept is log y zero. Okay, so you can look at that, and that will give you uh, a linear expression. <laughs> 